Clint's a Maine lobsterman, and the funny-looking water he's excited about is caused by a pogey, a plankton-eating, migratory fish that schools by the millions all along the eastern seaboard. They are a favorite bait of lobstermen and food for countless predators, so it's not surprising that when pogies are in, it's a big deal. In the summer, they can range as far north as Maine, and according to stories, have historically done so for eons. Interestingly, more so than other fish, during the day, they spend most of their time swimming near the surface, which makes them easy to see because it causes the water to look, well, funny. Were you to stick your head underwater for, say, a seal's eye view, you'd see thousands of tightly packed fish, just over a foot long, weighing about a pound each, running broad and deep, but being identically colored, dark on top, silver on the bottom, spotted at the gill, makes it near impossible to track an individual fish, despite their numbers. As I think about it, a lot of memories from my childhood growing up in the water involved pogies. Seeing them was as normal as seeing the ocean and the sun. A trio of ever-present actors. So imagine what it was like on those truly iconic Maine summer mornings. The ones depicted on the Wish You Were Here postcards with glowing orange hues highlighting wispy clouds and with an ocean that looked more like molten green glass than water. You'd hear the first slaps even before you could see the fish, a sign that they were out there somewhere. And as the sun rose, they'd grow more energetic and the increasing brightness of day would finally reveal their location and multitudes. And what's more, when they were in, it all but guaranteed a show full of other natural wonders would unfold. But what happened in the mid-90s was unexpected, at least to me. Pogies stopped coming. Not sure why, no single answer. Maybe changing migration patterns, overfishing, don't know. But one thing's for certain, they left and it was quiet out there. Being a kid from a non-fishing family, when it happened, I had no real context to understand the impact. But getting to know some lobstermen over the years, I've since learned a lot more. The culmination of skyrocketing bait prices, perpetually expensive fuel, and low market prices for lobsters have combined into such financial headwinds that there's no assurance setting out on a given day will even cover costs. Without relief, these factors make it next to impossible, it seems, to run a small lobster business. But that's why what happens next in this story is so miraculous. You see, the pogies came back. I have to believe this is something we went without for 25 years or so that back, as many as we've ever seen. And trust me, it's a godsend that they're here. So how much does bait cost? We need to buy it. It's uh, 190 a barrel right now for the one day for five bushel, about, about three of those. Of course, Harry and I heard were two hundred and seventy dollars a barrel. It used to be that lobster bait was less than ten percent. Yeah, on your expenses. Yeah. Now it's up 20, 25 percent. Wow. That uh, that makes a big difference in a uh, day's profitability, doesn't it? Yep, it sure does. How many traps do you haul a day? Well, Alex and I have 790 out. We haul a, We've been hauling a 490 day and a 300 day. But it varies. Everybody varies what they want to haul. So how many fish do you put in the trap? Four. Four. Three in places, four. Four most places. And the bait's good for one set, right? Uh, sometimes a little of it stays on. Yeah. And you fish five days a week, seven, four, four now. I don't, I don't drive. Yeah. Especially when we're doing this. 
You know, if the lobsters decide they're going to crawl, really awesome. I'll haul five or six days a week. Okay. When we're buying our bait, we have to, on our long day, we have to catch 100 pounds of lobsters before we turn a crop. But this is like uh, another, you know, half job. Yeah, yes. This is, this turns into work. Yeah. Sometimes people will pogey fish alone from a small boat with something called a gill net, which entangles the fish that try to swim through it. But it's heavy and slow work to haul them in by yourself. Then, after it's in, you still have to pick each fish out of the net by hand. I think just about everyone prefers to team up if they can, sometimes with a sternman, family, or a friend. It makes the work go faster. More industrious still are the larger purse nets, which can encircle a lot more fish, but you need a bigger boat and a bigger team. So how many folks does it take to run the scene? If you've got, if you've got one person for the, to run the skiff and five or six to haul the net, because I have to run the boat for it to be comfortable. Yeah. You can do it with less, but my saying is, is bigger than some of these guys, and it's a lot of work. When a catch is particularly productive with enough fish for many boats, it can get downright communal. And that leads me to my last point. Of all the good that's ensued from the pogies return, I'm particularly taken by the social impact. These fish not only brought some much needed economic relief to a besieged industry, they're also a critical component in what's become a vibrant social network that crosses fishing communities, territories, family lines, and generations. Lobstermen band together to work and share in something amazing. Everybody and their brother coming from all over the freaking state of Maine.